Welcome. It's the DNR Wild Tyke. Um, <laughs> the Wild, wild Tyke Podcast, where your toddlers, oh. where your <laughs> toddlers run wild through the woods. Oh. I'm going to totally leave that in. Thank you. Thank you. You know what that sound means. It's time for the Michigan DNR's Wild Talk Podcast. Welcome to the Wild Talk Podcast, where representatives from the DNR's Wildlife Division chew the fat and shoot the scat about all things habitat, feathers, and fur. With insights, interviews, and your questions answered on the air, you'll get a better picture of what's happening in the world of wildlife here in the great state of Michigan. And welcome to the DNR Wild Talk Podcast. I'm your host today, Katie Keene, and I have our producer with us, Eric Hilliard. Two months in a row. Can you believe it? We are coming at you with the September podcast. Pretty exciting that it's already September. Things are changing. Ferns are getting brown. You know, fall is on its way. What do you got going on in your world? My kids are already in school. That's how lucky I am. Yours is not in school yet, right? No, we still have um, days to go. We are an after Labor Day school system up here. So what we got coming up in the September podcast is our Around the State segment where we reach every corner of the state. We're talking about what staff are up to. Um, It gives you a little insight into what's going on with the Wildlife Division of the DNR. If you ever ask yourself, what are we doing? This is a great little way to find out. We're going to follow up with an interview with Dr. Kelly Straka. She is our state wildlife veterinarian, and we're going to just dig a little bit deeper into chronic wasting disease specifically, but we're not going to leave out bovine tuberculosis. We're going to also touch on that. Following that segment with Dr. Kelly Straka, we're going to unzip the mailbag, and we're going to give you a little lead in of what's going on in our world. Again, you're getting that insight of the calls we're getting, emails, probably questions that you're having yourself. So it's a fun segment to just give you a little glimpse of what's going on. And then we're going to follow up with elk viewing. September and October are awesome times to get up north and go view an elk in Michigan. Hey, Eric, did you know we have elk in Michigan? I, I actually did. I, but, a lot, but a lot of people don't. Okay. You did pass the test. Okay, good. You do. We do work together, right? So I've probably screamed it from the rooftops, but a lot of folks don't know. You've mentioned elk like once or twice, I think in the last few years. Yeah, just a couple times. So we want to make sure we're going to get that word out again because it's a hundredth anniversary of elk in 2018. So what a year to get up and view the herd. So we're going to close out with that segment. September podcast. Here we come right after this. Is it time to renew the license plate on your car or truck? When that moment arrives, show your support for Michigan elk and conservation by getting the wildlife habitat plate at the Secretary of State. 2018 marks the 100th year since the reintroduction of wild elk to the state of Michigan. And while the elk have been here for a century, this plate is only available for a limited time, so don't miss out. Visit mi.gov elk and click on the license plate for more information. Welcome back to the Around the State segment. Here, we're going to touch all the corners of the state and let you know what Wildlife Division staff are up to. So getting started in the Upper Peninsula or the UP. So winter, it's on their mind, even in the heat of the summer. Going into the fall, we're still thinking about winter. That's because habitat is essential for deer survival. And now is when we're doing that work. So both during the winter And even during spring breakup, when everything's starting to melt, deer still need to have food really close. They can't travel far. And this is where we come into play because it doesn't happen naturally. No, staff have to plan for it. The work is intentional. They need to think like a deer as they come out. Where is the food? We're planting rye and clover. We're doing some controlled burns and even mechanical or physical removal. In those food sources for wildlife, again, we're always thinking about what they need. And we have something called beech bark disease that's making its way across the Upper Peninsula. And what that means is less beech nuts. That's a food source for deer. So we got to think about what we can replace that with. And we got to think about it now. So what they're doing is they're planting four foot or taller red oak saplings. 
because red oak kick off acorns, and that's going to be another hard mast for deer to find. Something else UP staff are working on is a sharp tail grouse season that's getting ready October 10th. Um, what this means is from the 10th through the 31st, there's this one area of the state where we're going to have hunters targeting sharp tail grouse. It's the very east end of the UP. We use HAP lands, actually, the hunter access program. Those are the lands that the sharp tails are on. So we're focusing the effort there. You can visit mi.gov slash HAP. And you can find all those haplands in the East UP. Now, in addition to those sharp tailed grouse, we also have on September 15th, the grouse season starting up. We have GEMS or grouse enhanced management sites across the state. And so the UP has the majority of those locations. We even have a new one coming up this fall in the Ottawa National Forest called Norwich. So make sure you visit mi.gov slash GEMS to see those locations across the UP and in the Lower Peninsula. So Eric, that's what the staff are up to in the Upper Peninsula. What's happening down below the bridge? So staff in Southern Michigan have actually, both in the Southeast and the Southwest, they've been doing a lot of the same work or similar work. For example, everybody's getting ready for waterfowl season right now. It's right around the corner. So staff are preparing Michigan's wetland wonders for the upcoming hunting seasons, planting crops like corn and buckwheat and various small grains, and those are growing, and that's going to provide food for the water fowl as well as cover for hunters during this coming season. And surprisingly enough, I mean, it's been pretty dry throughout most of the state. I know in the southern part of the state, it's been dry. It's, it's been dry for you in the northern lower also. Yeah, the ferns seem to be really turning brown. You're walking through the woods. Just this weekend, I was noticing how crunchy everything is. It's dusty out. Yeah, I think I've mowed my lawn maybe three times this summer possibly. It's been super dry, but even with as dry as it's been, the growing season has actually been all right, at least as far as height goes. So hunters should have some good cover come this fall, even despite the dry conditions that we've had. Pretty soon staff in the south are going to be flooding the cornfields and grain fields in late September and early October. And that flooding is going to provide great resting and feeding habitat for the waterfowl that are migrating through the area. And so hunters are going to be able to check refuge counts, condition reports, uh, know what birds are in what areas by visiting mi.gov slash wetlandwonders. In addition to getting revved up for waterfowl season, there has been a ton of preparation for the upcoming deer season and for CWD surveillance in particular. As most of our listeners know, CWD has been detected in southern Michigan counties, mainly in the southwest region, but also in Jackson County, which is part of the southeast region. Now, staff in the southern part of the state are gearing up for a busy season of CWD surveillance. Right now, hiring is taking place to make sure we've got plenty of people out there to staff deer check stations. Uh, we've got some seasonal staffers. We'll be picking up roadkill deer for testing, and that's going to help us determine the extent of CWD in the state and if there are cases outside of the areas where we know CWD currently exists. We encourage hunters to have their deer checked, and you can visit mi.gov slash deer check for a list of check stations and head drop boxes that are available for this upcoming deer season. And deer check stations are a really great place to connect with a DNR wildlife division staff person. Wouldn't you agree, Katie? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people who come to deer check stations, the same one every year. It's on their drive home. And so it's their time to ask us that latest question they heard or a myth that they want to bust, you know, that they're hearing at deer camp right now. So it's awesome time to really get face to face with hunters and good relationship building just because we see them from year to year. It's a good time. If you don't want to wait until deer season or that time to go visit the deer check station, staff in the southeast are also going to be available at a few events this fall to answer questions and visit with hunters and other members of the public. One place they'll be is the Woods and Water Outdoor Show in Imlay City, September 7th through the 9th. And another is the Point Mouillet Waterfowl Festival, which runs September 15th and 16th. So come on out and see us. Katie, what do you got going on in the northern lower region? So Knuckles North, that's kind of how I like to describe the Northern Lower. We all can raise up our hand and give you the Lower Peninsula, right? So that's our Northern Lower Peninsula region. And so something that's really cool that's um, just happened was we have a water trail system dedication. So Beaver Island out in Lake Michigan is the latest location to get on board in the water trail system. So it's official. There's now 42 miles of paddling 
around Beaver Island, which is the largest island in Lake Michigan. You know, you might ask yourself, well, what does this have to do with the DNR or Wildlife Division? Well, most of Beaver Island is actually public land. So we have staff that spend significant time on the island working with the community, uh, making sure there's access and just great opportunities to see what's out there and to use the resource. So being part of the water trail system out in Beaver Island is pretty cool. They got maps with amenities for you to help plan your trip. So if you're into that, if you love paddling, you know, check it out. It's just another opportunity out there. And now we have to mention elk, right? It is September. September 8th, we're having a gathering in downtown Gaylord at the Pavilion. It's conservation leaders of today talking about what happened in the past and what's happening in the future for elk. Because remember, 2018 is that 100-year anniversary of Michigan. See, I got elk in again in this podcast, Eric. You did. You're like, you're you're cramming elk in everywhere. Anywhere that you can smash an elk into this podcast, you're doing it. I'm going to do it. That's my goal. Elk across the podcast. So we have the event on September 8th in Gaylord. Make sure to come and check it out. 5 p.m. will get started. It's going to be a fun time. So the other way I'm going to make sure to mention elk here is, of course, the first elk hunting season is actually underway. We have 100 lucky Michigan hunters that will have 12 days to hunt elk in Michigan. So we kick off the elk season with elk orientation. This is where every lucky hunter gets to come and learn about um, elk management, how to harvest an elk and elk regulations. Because you know, most people have never hunted an elk before unless they traveled out of state. This is their first time. So it's a lot different. We wanna make sure folks are educated, they know what to do. So everyone comes to this elk orientation. We have staff available to help answer any questions they have. And don't forget, only Michigan residents can hunt elk. So staff are working elk check. You know, every elk that is harvested has to be brought in to the elk check station. This time of year, because it's so hot out, we actually go to them. We want to make this harvest as successful as possible. And part of that is getting that elk meat cool as quick as they can because it's such a large animal. So our staff are out finding the hunters, finding that harvest location. We do a little disease surveillance of the carcass. We also remove a tooth to age the elk. So we're doing some work for elk check station. And it takes all of our staff to be able to do that because we have a hundred hunters that are going to harvest a lot of elk. And you know, a new group of 100 hunters will be out in December. So it's really exciting stuff right now in the elk world. Well, that sounds like uh, everybody's pretty much busy all across the state. I think that about wraps it up. Yeah. And coming up next, stick with us. We're going to have our state wildlife vet, Dr. Kelly Straka, and we're going to talk about chronic wasting disease, and several other diseases we see here in Michigan. The elk and bear draw has come and gone, but you can still enter the Pure Michigan Hunt and have a shot at both elk and bear, along with spring and fall turkey, antlerless deer, and first pick at a managed waterfowl area. If you're one of the three lucky winners, not only do you get all those licenses, but you'll also receive a hunting prize package valued at over $4,000. Get a $5 application or two anywhere hunting licenses are sold or online at mi.gov slash PMH. So let's dive into our next piece. We have a interview with Dr. Kelly Straka. She's our state wildlife veterinarian for the Michigan DNR. Dr. Straka, thanks for being here with us. Hey, you guys. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for coming in. Appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule and giving our listeners a chance to know a little bit more about what it is you do. People probably hear wildlife veterinarian and they're wondering, you know, do people bring their (laughs) their deer in for their rabies shots? You know, are you doing checkups? You know, what is it that a wildlife veterinarian does for the state? So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, about your job, um, and maybe even where you came from before you came to join us here in the great state of Michigan? Sure. Thanks. This is actually a really exciting opportunity for me. It's not often I get to do something like this where I know I can um, reach out to a lot of people. So this is really exciting. 
So as you mentioned, I'm a wildlife veterinarian. That does not mean that I do um, currently something like wildlife rehabilitation. And I get asked that a lot, you know, oh, so you, you know, you treat, you treat rabbits, you treat deer, you treat foxes and skunks. No, I did. Um, I, I, I did work in wildlife rehab for a few years and it's, that's an incredible field. But my, my work now for the state of Michigan is much more focused on sort of what we look at for herd health, you know, population health. Uh, what do we know about the wildlife populations in the state and what disease or health threats might they be facing? Um, how can we sort of limit some of those risk factors that might make them more susceptible to disease? And and how do we really manage for good populations, good healthy populations across the state? So it's an exciting field. There aren't very many people in in this position. There's only about 20, maybe 20 to 30 state wildlife veterinarians that actually get to do the kind of work I do. So I'm I'm honored to be here. So you've been with us since? I've been here just going about two years. Awesome. And where were you before this? Yeah, it's it's kind of one of those, how long is this podcast? Because I have got quite the story. Um, so I'm originally a Minnesota girl. I still consider myself a Minnesota girl, although I'm rapidly rapidly falling in love with Michigan. But uh, I went to vet school in Minnesota. I did my undergrad in Minnesota. I also got a master's degree in public health in Minnesota, um, which is really similar to Michigan. Minnesota and Michigan, I think the upper Midwest in general uh, have a lot in common. So I started out as a wildlife biologist. I did some work with nonprofit groups, um, organizations like Ducks Unlimited. I also worked for the Minnesota DNR and I was with Fish and Wildlife Service for a little while. Then I, I decided I wanted to go back to school and go back to vet school. Um, I was actually living and working in Hawaii when I decided to go back to vet school. And I went specifically for wildlife health. So I never went into vet school thinking I was going to practice. Um, and so I'm really happy with that choice. I'm happy I made it. So I went to vet school back in 2008. After graduation, I got hired on by the state of Missouri to be a wildlife health veterinarian there and start their wildlife health program. They'd never had a veterinarian before. So technically came here from Missouri, spent about four years there. Um, helping to build their wildlife health program, which is a great opportunity. And now I now I get to come here and work with a great team. Well, I'm so glad Michigan got Dr. Straka. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Katie. So we have three wildlife diseases that are being talked about a lot right now. Chronic wasting disease is obviously probably one of the biggest ones that's at the forefront of most people's minds. Uh, but we also have bovine tuberculosis, um, which is also talked about. And then most recently, West Nile virus has kind of popped up, particularly uh, pertaining to the rough grouse population. Could you maybe give us a quick rundown about the effects these diseases have on the animals that they infect? Yeah, you actually, you, you gave me a quite a laundry list there. And it's, it's it's exciting for me because I'll be honest in that I don't I don't do well with sort of routine the same nine to five um, you know uh, routine work over and over and and my position is very fortunate I guess in that I get to deal with many different things. And so when you start talking about those three diseases you named in particular, so chronic waste and disease, bovine tuberculosis, and West Nile virus, they're very different. Um, not only because of the animals they infect and the, and the effects they can have on those animals, but what causes them. So I'll, I'll give a couple minutes to each, try not to bore anybody too much. But again, this is, this is my bread and butter. So I talk about this stuff every day. We'll start with chronic waste and disease because I think it's on the forefront of a lot of people's minds and it's in the media a lot and in a lot of conversations. What we know about chronic waste and disease is that it is a disease of the cervid family. It affects members of the cervid family. So those are deer. So deer, elk, moose, reindeer, those are the animals we worry about with chronic waste and disease to this at, at this point. And what causes this disease is actually something that is normal in their bodies. So it's caused by a protein that you and I have too. We all have these proteins called prions. Um, but what happens with these specific prions is that with this disease, they misfold when they're being sort of uh, replicated in the body, right? We know that proteins are always being turned over and there's a trigger and we don't know what that trigger is, but these proteins misfold. And when they do, they don't behave like they should. Um, it's been described in the literature as they, they, they go rogue. They turn into rogue proteins and they can encounter other prion proteins and make them misfold and they stop functioning like normal, happy proteins. So one of the things, one of the things we worry about is, okay, well, so this is affecting deer and, and it's this protein thing. Well, what 
happens? What happens over time is once these proteins start to accumulate within the individual animals, they result in neurologic signs. So you start to see animals that are staggering, that are stumbling, that that maybe lose sense of their awareness. They become very uncoordinated. They drool excessively and, and they start to lose weight. And so that's one of the things you worry about is that this disease is contagious between animals. And to the best of our knowledge, it is always fatal. So if an animal is infected with chronic wasting disease, it is going to die more rapidly than we would expect a normal, healthy animal to have. So we worry about it. There's a lot of research that's come out of the last few years that it shows uh, it's going to have population impacts on a herd level. So all of a sudden, this isn't just a, a, a tragedy to happen to an individual animal. This can actually drive population declines. And that's one of the big concerns we have. So that's that's chronic wasting disease. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that if we need to. I'm happy to talk about that at any time. But let's switch gears a little bit to bovine tuberculosis because that's also a, an important uh, disease to talk about when you start talking about the health of Michigan's deer. And bovine, bovine TB has been around. Our first detection was back in the 70s, but we, we didn't find another case until about 1994. Or so we found a TB positive deer. And bovine TB is caused not by a protein like chronic wasting disease, but it's caused by a bacteria, a really slow growing bacteria. And this bacteria can infect multiple different species. So we know that bovine TB can be zoonotic. And what I mean by that is it can affect humans. That has not been shown with chronic wasting disease. Obviously, there's a lot of work in that arena right now, but we know that TB can infect humans and it has in the state of Michigan. It also can impact cattle. And that is a, a serious issue, especially for anyone who's trying to raise cattle up in an area where we have bovine tuberculosis in the deer. So this disease is primarily affects the respiratory tract. So you start to see pneumonias, a lot of issues breathing. Um, and, and like I said, we do have it in deer here in Michigan. We are the only state that does have bovine tuberculosis, what I call endemic, which just means that it, it exists and it, it has existed for quite some time in our free-ranging white-tailed deer population. Finally, we're going to switch gears to West Nile. And West Nile virus is, is one of those nice diseases because the answer is in the name, right? It's caused by a virus. So whereas TB is a bacteria, CWD is a protein, we have this virus. And we know that West Nile virus can uh, affect over 250 species of primarily birds, but also some mammals. It is also considered to be a zoonotic disease in that humans can contract West Nile virus. Now, most human infections with this virus are going to be asymptomatic, so you might not even know that you're positive for West Nile. Um, but about one in five people can suffer sort of a, a fever illness or a flu-like illness, and it can progress to serious complications leading to meningitis or inflammation of the, the lining around the brain and also inflammation in the spinal cord. So it can progress to a very serious condition in humans, especially um, elderly or immunocompromised people. So West Nile is kind of hitting the, the, the headlines lately because of potential concerns it might be having on our ruffed grouse population. In Michigan last year, we had 12 cases of West Nile in ruffed grouse, and that that was a landmark for us. We'd only had one previous case diagnosed back, I think, in 2002. So you couple with this finding of West Nile um, virus and grouse populations with some research that came out of Pennsylvania that suggested that if animals are experimentally infected, if grouse are experimentally infected, it can kill them. So it's one of those concerns. We don't know if West Nile virus is having a population level impact on the grouse, but we certainly want to start doing some surveillance this fall. And we're asking hunters for their help uh, to try to get some samples and see if we can get a better handle on what's going on with that virus. So hopefully that wasn't too too lengthy for you and I didn't lose too many listeners. So it's almost like our hunters get to play field scientist for a little bit this year then. Which is such a cool opportunity, right? And that's one of the things I really like about this is in Michigan's, you know, we're so unique in that we have this wonderful wildlife disease laboratory. And and quite honestly, it's it's unlike any other place in the country. I'm so honored to work at this lab and I work with a great team of scientists and epidemiologists and pathologists and people that are so, so educated and so intelligent and brilliant in the field of wildlife health. So yeah, what I like to do is be able to have these opportunities where, where hunters and landowners and the public can get involved and help us with some of our health monitoring in the state. That's great. And you know, a disease kind of shifting from those, the three that I just kind of threw at you there, looking at a, at a different disease um, that can affect bats and likewise humans that come into contact with bats potentially is rabies. And I know personally, I've seen posts on social media lately about people who've woken up to bats in their house 
you know, in those situations, should those people be concerned? Uh, how would they handle a situation like that? What should they do with the bat? What would you recommend in those types of situations or, or maybe some things that people should be aware of? Yeah, thanks for bringing up rabies, actually. The, it's really timely. So this time of year, August, September, um, we start to see, we, we can see a very active month for rabies. And that's because a lot of those those bats um, are starting to become, those pups are starting to leave their, their roosts. They're starting to become more active. People can find bats in their houses. Um, rabies is, as I mentioned before, with West Nile and bovine TB, rabies is a zoonotic disease. So we know it can infect people. I'm, I'm hoping all of our listeners are aware of that, but this is a really serious one. This will be fatal uh, to humans if infected. So when we look at kind of what our situation is to date in 2018, we've had 58 rabies positive animals detected so far and 56 of those have been bats. The other two were skunks. So bats are our, our most common vector that we find positive with rabies. So when you have a situation, if you wake up in your home and there's a bat in your room and you you don't know if you've been bitten because I don't think people realize it, but you don't always know if you've been bitten by a bat. It doesn't always hurt, especially if you're bitten in your sleep. The best recommendation is going to be to, you know, get yourself to a safe area, get away from the bat if at all possible and, and contact your local health department and ask for advice and guidance. There's also a really good website, Michigan's Emerging Disease website, has specific information on who you should contact and how you should contact. But especially if you've got a child in the room or if you walk into, you know, your children's room and, and there there is a bat present, those are absolutely those kind of situations where we're going to want to get that bat tested for rabies and just make sure there's no exposure. The same would be con- the same would be true for, you know, if you're around any um, elderly individuals or, or anyone that can't communicate if anything had happened, you just, you want to make sure that nobody was, was exposed to that bat. People need to realize that um, in order to test a bat for rabies, it does have to be euthanized or it does have to be killed, but they do not have to do that. So if they can safely trap the bat without actually coming in contact with it, that's going to be the recommendation. And you can transport that to your health department uh, and we'll take, you know, they'll, they'll take care of the rest for the testing. So I think it's just really important for people to be aware of that and to be cognizant that, yeah, rabies is a very uh, a significant health risk. And so I always try as a veterinarian, it's been ingrained, try to recommend people remember to vaccinate your pets and, um, and remember just to be smart around wild animals. Don't bring wild animals into your home. Great. Great. And so basically talk to your local health department and then also the emerging diseases website. And I believe there's a direct link people can get to michigan.gov slash rabies um, should get people to that location on the emerging diseases website. So great. Thank you very much for that information. Of course. So if I could shift gears just a little bit, there's uh, something I've seen repeated a number of times in social media, and I wanted to kind of get your take on it. So people have have said they're basically accusing the Michigan DNR with some of these new CWD regulations that have come out um, is taking the the same failed approach. They say that other states have taken. Would you say that that is an accurate assessment that we're doing things just like other states are or that that approach is somehow um, flawed in some way? Could you maybe elaborate on that a little bit and what your thoughts might be? I've seen those. I've seen those. um, I'll go ahead and call them criticisms. I've seen them. I've heard them. I've, you know, I've, I've had some of those addressed my way too and, and how I feel about that. And I, I disagree with that. And for several reasons, I think one of the things is that keep in mind, this disease is, um, unlike anything else we've dealt with in free ranging wildlife. And, um, and I think where other states may have gone wrong is that they try to do the right thing or recommend the right thing from a disease management approach, but either they don't have the support of the stakeholders or, you know, they're not effectively communicating why they're doing what they're doing. And so I don't criticize other states for, for what they've done. I think everybody operates with the best available science they have at the time. I think Michigan has taken a, a very different approach, a much more thoughtful um a much more insightful approach in trying to be as transparent as possible with why some recommendations are coming out, why we would look at doing things that maybe other states have tried, why we think we would have a different result. And we're also, I think, significantly more open with exploring things that other people haven't tried. Now, I think where we, you know, where where people get concerned is that they're not seeing immediate changes. And that's that's intentional because something like this is going to take time. CWD is a significant threat to both deer and deer hunting. And so you, you really have to be careful with how you're going to approach it. It doesn't spread like wildfire. I, I keep saying that. We have, we have time to be thoughtful with our approach. 
but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything. It doesn't mean we should sit back. It means we we have to be very thoughtful and intentional with what we're going to do with management. And this is a marathon. This is longer than a marathon. This is one of those crazy, you know, 200 mile ultra marathon endurance events that a crazy small number of people run. But this is something that Michigan's in for the long run. And I think that the DNR in particular has has done a really good job of understanding that and, and embracing the fact that this is going to be a commitment we have to look for years to come. So to be um, impulsive, and to be reactive to the situation is not going to be useful. So I think I think that Michigan's done a really good job of, of being intentional with their actions. Looking back to the chronic wasting disease symposium that we had back in October, and I know some of the things that Chad Stewart had shown in that presentation, that's available on the YouTube channel, by the way, for anybody who wants to go back and take a look at that presentation. If I remember correctly in his slideshow that he had, he kind of sh- did a, a compare and contrast between the state of Illinois and the state of Wisconsin. And, you know, Wisconsin had started off very aggressively, but then kind of eased up on things a little bit, whereas Illinois continued to maintain a very aggressive um, approach to management with the help of hunters harvesting as many deer as possible within those CWD areas. And as a result, you you kind of saw CWD contained to a large extent in Illinois, whereas in Wisconsin, once they had kind of eased up on things, that's when you saw it spread to other areas of the state. But would you say that's, am I getting that right? Am I remembering that correctly from his presentation? Yeah, yeah, you absolutely are. And I, I think I can picture the graph that, that you're talking about. And you're right, it's absolutely in that presentation. If anybody hasn't seen that or any of those talks from that the CWD symposium that we hosted last October, they're very useful. And, and they were presented by a variety of experts, honestly. So we had a two-day symposium. The first day was very heavy on the science of CWD, the epidemiology, which is just a fancy word for kind of the study of the disease. So the epidemiology of CWD, that was day one. And then day two was management, where we actually invited folks from other states to come in. So if you haven't, if any of the listeners have not seen any of those videos, please, you know, as, as Eric mentioned, go to the YouTube site and watch them. They're, they're very informative. Talking about time and being really intentional with your approach. So, um, most folks are going to notice that maybe uh, deer regulations were a little bit later than usual for 2018 for this fall. So we've got you here. We can pick your brain. So tell us kind of what happened that was different this year and why were those regs so late? Yeah, I, I can tell you a uh, very firsthand that it was not because we were sitting back, um, you know, reading the paper and drinking coffee. I can tell you that this this has been a a, a really interesting process. It's been a lot of work and there've been a lot of people involved. So let me talk a little bit about that timeline because I think you're right. It wasn't until August 9th at the commission meeting that that CWD regulations were decided. So when we go back to October, 2017, we hosted the symposium. Out of that CWD research and management symposium came a CWD working group. And what that was is it was a, a group of folks that were tasked and I was I co-chaired that committee along with our state veterinarian, Dr. James Averill. We co-chaired this committee to come up with regu- or recommendations for the Natural Resources Commission to consider. So we presented those in January. From January to June, one of the largest things that came out of that recommendations package was a need to really involve stakeholders, a need to be very transparent, a need to be very open and and open to new ideas. And that's what I alluded to earlier when I was saying this is a really intentional thing. So we did. We we embarked on a massive stakeholder engagement campaign and it, it it constituted a lot of outreach efforts from folks like you guys. So thanks for that. As well as CWD focus groups and uh, public meetings. And there were, there were a number of different efforts that were made to really engage stakeholders across the state of Michigan, not not necessarily our, our normal historical big deer hunting groups either. I mean, it was a it varied from taxidermists and meat processors to rehabilitate wildlife rehabilitation folks to even the Farm Bureau, you know, was involved in this too. And, and um, privately owned survey the industry too. So, so we really reached out to all those groups. So from January to June, we got a lot of input. We engaged a lot of folks to see what are their thoughts? What, what do they think? What should be your goal for CWD management in Michigan? And out of that came recommendations to the Natural Resources Commission in June. And understandably, there was a lot of information that we shared and the commission did a good job of asking for more follow-up. They wanted more information. They wanted more background. They wanted to make sure they were doing their due diligence. And so from June to August, they literally took those two months to look at every recommendation that came out. Several amendments were 
offered, that then the, the DNR could take those amendments and look and see, okay, how does this fit into our, our proposed management structure? How does it fit into our surveillance plan? All of that has been actively happening, and it all led up to the culmination of the August 9th um, Natural Resources Commission meeting where those regulations were decided. So it all happened in a relatively short timeline after, you know, the, everything was vetted. Yeah, we definitely hit the ground running August 9th. And one of those big changes that came out was the baiting and feeding ban, which parts of the state are going to see this year. Others are going to see in 2019. So can you talk a little bit about why? Why was baiting and feeding banned? And kind of walk us through that. Yeah, baiting and feeding of, of, of wildlife and servants in particular, is it's an extremely sensitive issue. And I'm very aware of that. And, and Michigan has a long history of looking at the effects that baiting and feeding may have on deer populations, especially in light of, of diseases like we talked about earlier with bovine tuberculosis. So one of the biggest concerns we have with, with artificial baiting and feeding of deer is that it does congregate deer to come in contact with each other. And obviously, as I talked about earlier with CWD, CWD is a contagious disease. So if you're drawing these animals, artificially drawing them to share the same point of a food source, that's going to be an additive risk. So one of the arguments I hear is, well, you know, these animals contact each other all the time in nature. What are you going to do? You know, make sure they can't come in contact with each other. Well, no, but risk is additive. So if there is something that we are doing that could be making things worse, we really need to take a serious look at that. And can we minimize that risk? How can we remove uh, additional additive um, sources of disease transmission. So keep in mind, as I didn't talk about earlier, when I said CWD is, is um, contagious between animals, these proteins that are infectious, right, that make these animals sick, they can be shed. They're shed in, in heavy amounts in saliva. They're shed also in feces and in smaller quantities, they're shed in urine. So not only are these animals that are feeding on the same bait pile potentially sharing saliva and encountering each other's saliva at those, you're also having these animals standing around each other, urinating, defecating for longer periods of time than would be normally seen. We also have some literature out of Michigan that has shown that the increase in harvest over bait piles has not been uh, a noticeable increase. It's not a significant increase. So that's one of the arguments is that people won't harvest deer if there's not baiting allowed. Well, our data doesn't support that. And so there, there are a number of studies that have been looked at that are looking at uh, the risks of increased disease transmission around things like artificial um, bait sites. So that's definitely one of the things that the commission took into effect or took into consideration when they, when they looked at that recommendation. So this baiting and feeding ban here in Michigan, we're not alone. There are other states that have these same regulations in place, correct? Yes, absolutely. And so, in fact, you know, we've always sort of said when we had um, chronic waste and disease, we first detected it in 2015 and and we immediately enacted a feeding and baiting ban in that immediate area, right? So in our disease zone and several other states have done the same thing. And, and again, it's, it's, it's a well-recognized source of disease transmission, right? It's a source of risk. And so I, I would say it's sort of the... Um, the response is to ban something like that to, again, try to remove some of that extra risk of transmission. So our very first deer seasons of 2018 are right ahead of us. What would you say is the big takeaway for this year's deer hunting class? You know, what are their changes that they need to make sure they're on top of for this fall? Yeah, the big takeaway this year for hunters is please keep hunting. Get out there. Enjoy it. I hunt. I teach my children to hunt. I think that hunting in Michigan is a tradition and a heritage that we need to pass on to future generations. But at the same point in time, there needs to be a little bit of a culture shift among us hunters in that our actions matter. So if you aren't familiar with CWD, there is a lot of information on our website, mi.gov backslash CWD, and you can learn more about the disease and what you can do as a hunter to minimize the risk of making this disease worse. One of the things that comes to mind is proper carcass disposal and carcass movement. So we do have carcass movement regulations that you can learn about, but also keep in mind that just be smart when you're out there. When you're driving around with a carcass in the back of your truck, please don't please don't push it off the tailgate in the back 40. You know, we're, we're asking people to be mindful of where they're putting carcasses on the landscape because those can be potentially infectious to other animals and they can be scattered around by scavengers as well. So when you get out there, just do your best to educate yourself on not only the regulations, but the recommendations for hunters to help us in the fight against CWD. And anyone in the state, they can get their deer head um, checked, correct? I mean, they can go to any one of our 
close to 100 deer check stations across the state. Absolutely. So we will test deer from anywhere across the state. Obviously, we have um, a strong need to better understand this disease where we know it exists. We want to know exactly how much is there and how widespread it is. But but like Katie said, we will test deer from anywhere in the state. And we have a great interactive map set up at mi.gov slash deer check. Make sure to check that out. Well, Kelly, thank you again so much for coming in today and for sharing really some excellent information on a variety of wildlife diseases. It's greatly appreciated. Absolutely, guys. Thanks for having me. Deer hunters, are you ready to buy your regular deer license for this fall so you can harvest an antlered buck? Don't forget that if you want the chance to harvest two antlered deer, you're going to need to buy that combination license up front. That will give you one regular tag and one restricted tag to use. If you only buy the single deer license, you won't be able to buy that restricted tag later on. So if you want more buck for your bang, be sure to pick up the combination license. Visit mi.gov deer for more information. All right, fasten those seatbelts. We're headed down to get the mailbag. We're going to unzip it. And at the bottom, we're going to start from the bottom, Eric. You always start from the top of the mailbag. I want to dig down first. One, two, three. I got an email the other day from Jason, and he just was pulling into work at a unnamed store this morning in Traverse City, and he saw a deer way out in the woods, and the cool thing about today is he got a picture of it. I love the fact that everyone's got a smartphone out there or a trail camera, so so many of our emails now have pictures attached. So I was able to open up the picture, and it was a large spot on the deer that he was concerned about. What it was, was a deer fibroma. It's a mass that deer can get. It's almost like a tumor or a wart, but it's outward. So you can see it. And usually you can see it pretty good from any type of distance or trail camera. So the concern is, is, you know, what's wrong with this deer? So usually they're in the eye, neck or face region. And the thing to take away is this is just with the skin. It's not affecting the general health of the deer especially come deer season, if someone harvests a deer and they find a fibroma or this hanging nodule on, on the deer, it's not affecting its health. You could still consume the deer. It's, um, it's relatively common. You know, we do get a lot of pictures sent to us nowadays that have uh, deer fibromas. So the big thing is, is it's uh, not affecting that general health. It is something that we see. Yeah, I know some of the pictures I've seen where people have sent in deer fibromas. A lot of times you'll see them, they'll be clustered together in a big clump. And so that those usually tend to be the cases where people are a little bit more alarmed because it's not just this one spot, but they see a whole collection of fibromas together in a big cluster on a deer. Yeah, the biggest thing is it's definitely unsightly for us to see, but the health of the deer, it's, it's not affecting their health. Uh, they're not going to die from it. It. They and it's still consumable if you are to harvest a deer like that. All right, another email I just received was from Ashley, and she was from the Sioux up in the Upper Peninsula, and she has a picture of a doe on her trail camera. Pictures are worth a thousand words when you're trying to explain something to someone, and just having that photo helps so much. So she sent a picture of a doe that's missing a lot of hair on her back. And she asked some people and she was concerned it could be mange. So this is a great question because this is the time of year where deer are in that in-between period where they're um, starting to get their winter coat. So it's looking a little raggedy. <laughs> you know, hair's missing, hair's growing in. It's just not that pretty coat that we're used to seeing. And you know, years ago, you didn't have a trail camera out there to get you those up-close pictures of deer out of season. So this is something that maybe people never had saw before is a deer getting its winter fur or pelage. So it's possible that when you do see that fluctuation in their coat, that it could be some type of dermatitis. But fortunately, because you're watching that trail camera, there's a good chance you're going to get to see that doe again. So just keeping an eye on that deer on your trail camera, you should be able to see her throughout the next few weeks to months grow in that full coat and that raggediness just disappears. But going right to mange is a pretty common thought that a lot of people have anytime you have that hair or skin issue. But just knowing so many animals have different coats, you know, they got to get rid of that heavy winter coat in the spring and then they got to start preparing 
for winter. And that it just doesn't happen overnight. They have to grow in that hair, that fur over time. Yeah. And it's funny that you should mention mange because actually fairly recently Steve wrote and uh, Stephen says, DNR, while I'm not sure if this is anything you track or otherwise deal with, I wanted to bring it to your attention. I spotted a squirrel with mange in my yard today. I had to use my binoculars to confirm it. It had huge bare spots of pink skin on both sides of its body and a large bare stripe down its back. I've never seen mange in a squirrel before, just dog-like breeds, coyotes, things like that. Other than the very apparent mange, the animal seemed in good health. It moved easily and showed no weakness. My major concern is if the mage is contagious to other squirrels. Any information or guidance would be helpful. Thank you, Stephen. So, you know, Steve saw something that he didn't typically see or that he'd never seen before, which was a squirrel with mange. And so as Katie had mentioned, mange is a skin disease of mammals and it's it's caused by a mite. And there are different types of mange and squirrels tend to contract what is called notoedric mange. Now, notoedric mites are not transmissible to humans, canines, or feline pets. So your dog's not going to, you know, get it. Your cat shouldn't get it. It is transmissible to other squirrels and hair loss is the key indicator of the disease. Now, one of the things the DNR recommends doing if you have squirrels with mange in your area, particularly if they're congregating together, is to remove any food sources, things like bird feeders, or if you're putting out seed, you know, try to not put the things out that are going to cause those squirrels to congregate together and have physical contact with one another. What that'll do is that'll actually help reduce the spread of the disease. And it's not necessarily fatal to the squirrels. However, it could lead to the death of a squirrel, especially in winter time. So, you know, they could die of exposure, just like you, if you go out in the winter without a coat on. Uh, if a squirrel doesn't have its coat, then it could freeze and succumb to the cold from the loss of the hair. Now, we always appreciate reports of any disease wildlife, and you can provide detailed sightings and information via our reporting form, which is available at michigan.gov slash eyes in the field. Coming up next, we have our piece about elk viewing for this fall, which is so relevant for September and October. Check yes for the Recreation Passport when you renew your license plate at the Michigan Secretary of State. The Recreation Passport is just $11 when purchased with your license plate registration renewal and is your key to visiting more than 100 state parks, accessing staff public boat launches, parking for rustic forest campgrounds, and hundreds of miles of trails, attending free family outdoor events and classes and protecting our natural resources for the next generation. Visit michigan.gov slash recreation passport for more information. Hey, Eric, did you know that September and October are the best times to view elk in Michigan? Katie, are you talking about elk again? Oh, guilty. Yep. Totally going down that elk road again. Well, since you're here, since you brought us here, uh, elk, or I mean, Eric, let's go <laughs> with it, right? September and October are a great time to view elk. It's their breeding season. And we all know animals act a little bit different when it's breeding season. They're moving around. They're in places that they might not normally be. And fortunately for us, that's a good time for us to see them and hear them. So elk can give off, both males and females, loud whistles and bugles for how they communicate to each other. And you can be lucky enough to actually go up into northeast Michigan, the lower peninsula, and hear elk this time of year. Now, maybe you might get to see them too, which is a pretty lucky occurrence. In Michigan, we have just over 1,200 elk, but the Chance of really getting to see wildlife can be rare. That's kind of what makes it so exciting. But they gather in these open grassy areas. And this is a good viewing point for us. We actually maintain these locations, meaning that we plant stuff there, we cut it. So our goal is to provide a food source and a place for them to gather. And then we put them on maps so that people can actually have this little treasure hunt. You can go and get a viewing brochure, download it, save it to your phone, take a picture of it. And take you and your family out and find these locations that elk are known to be. Now, the best time to view elk is at dawn and dusk. So you might have to drag the family out early or keep them up late, pack a lunch in the car or something. But that's the best time 
animals are, are out moving is that early and really late time of the day. Now, just like viewing any other animal, keep a distance. Don't try to approach the elk or anything, but you can get great spotting scopes. You can hear them from a distance. So even though you're not up close and personal, to be able to see a huge majestic elk, hundreds of pounds, the size of a horse, I mean, that would be so cool for you and your family. So what you're saying, Katie, is it's probably a good idea if I go to michigan.gov slash elk and I download my elk viewing brochure, I head up north with the family, maybe we leave early that day, spend a little bit of time in some of those nice little uh, up north communities, maybe get some lunch, get some dinner, and then head out as it's getting later towards the evening to um, get a good shot at seeing some of those elk with the family. Yeah, that's that's a great idea. Think of those small towns like Wolverine and Atlanta, Vanderbilt. Go right up there in the heart of the Pigeon River country. And there are openings that you can drive to, but we also have openings that you have to hike in. So if you're kind of looking for more of that backcountry remote experience where you can really get in there quiet and wait for dust to settle in, see if you can hear them, see if you can spot them. I mean, what an experience that would be. And don't forget, coming up on September 8th in Gaylord, we have a gathering of conservation leaders and everyone that just loves elk. We're going to get started at 5 p.m. at the downtown Gaylord Pavilion. And we're going to have gourmet gone wild food. We're going to have leaders from the conservation community and just a little celebration, a little shindig all about the elk 100th. Well, that wraps things up for this month. Thank you all for joining us today. And don't forget to subscribe to the Wild Talk podcast. And we'll see you next month. This has been the Wild Talk podcast, your monthly podcast airing the first of each month and offering insights into the world of wildlife across the state of Michigan. You can reach the Wildlife Division at 517-284-9453 or dnr-wildlife at michigan.gov.